Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I am Tom. On today's show, this is the first in-person interview that I've done since, God, maybe two seasons ago? No, last season I did one. Either way, it's the first one since the whole shutdown. So I meet someone today in Madison, uh, Stephen Lee Rich. He is a singer-songwriter, uh, comedian. He actually comes from a comedy background. He's been doing, he's been a self-sustaining musician since the 70s. He started out in Chicago. He Then we go through the whole timeline of how he ended up here in Madison, what he's doing now, the type of music he does, how he, uh, a lot of the places, famous places that he played along the way, uh, most of them closed. That's one of the things that we discover is every place he seems to play always ends up getting closed down or demolished or something, which was kind of a funny little running gag that went throughout the episode. But uh, we sit down and talk and it's in person. It was great. I was, it was at my new studio. Well, not my new studio. I started, I wanted to do some video recordings at my band's studio. So this is what happened. I had it all set up. I went there the night before, had the camera set up, set up the angles, got the lighting right, had the mic set up, had everything all set, left it there, met him the next day, went to turn it on. And one of my cameras just could not be recognized. Like something went wrong. And I'm like, Ugh. so we ended up only doing an audio version of this podcast, which uh, that's too bad. And, and I had it. So I still have something. Uh, I only have like one more in-person interview here uh, on this season so far. And hopefully maybe I'll have something hooked up by then. I don't know. We'll see. But for right now, yeah, it's, it's only audio. Um, but it was great to meet him. It was, uh, I was glad that he reached out to me and we sat down and talk about the crazy musician life that this person has lived and also how he plans on doing a live stream, live comedy stream, variety show type thing. His whole background is in variety and vaudeville and, uh, his music's kind of Americana. So here is my interview with Stephen Lee Rich starting right now. What I saw is you're originally from California? No, Chicago. Chicago. Oh, so okay. It's, okay. So tell me so tell me the long strange trip of getting here to Madison. Uh long strange trip. I I've started out really my next year officially I will I will begin my fiftieth year okay. as an entertainer. I'm counting from nineteen seventy two when I did my first actual gig. Okay. Okay. Uh, most people will count from the first time somebody handed you money. Well, for me, that was in 69. I was in California okay. uh, visiting friends in Merced, in Mariposa. And it was over Labor Day weekend. There was a county fair, and I entered the talent contest and won five bucks in the first round. Okay. But I'm not going to count my career from there. I didn't actually start working, you know, yeah, until yeah. three years later. Um but I've done, I think, just about everything you can do okay. in this business. I have I started as a folk singer in, in Chicago when the folk scene really was winding down. You it, know? Was, it was towards the tail end of it. Everybody was getting into the disco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's kind of what was happening. And it got to a point, actually, in the mid-70s where if you called yourself a folk singer, you couldn't get arrested a little higher. Really? Well, then why did you do it? You know, <laughs> this is what I do. Well, I made the lateral move to comedy clubs. Hmm. Because in, in, at that time, folk musicians were also entertainers. You okay. know, the ethic, because we had been mainstream show business for yeah. so long and doing mains, you know, even the Kingston Trio and Peter, Paul, and Mary did Vegas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, there was an ethic there of being an entertainer mm -hmm. as well. And so there was a lot of the vaudeville ethic that came down to it. Right. Uh, so it was more of the, it wasn't just songs, it was shtick leading into songs yeah and, it was it you know funny intros this kind of thing okay so i made the lateral move into comedy clubs yeah for a couple of years which you know it seems like a smart move yeah it worked for a while yeah you know and uh i was uh, what, what what is now called a guitar act that term didn't exist at the time <laughs> you know okay it was just there was a lot of guys like me who had just kind of lost any possibility of getting work you know as, as singers and but still knew how to do the stand up. And right. We were, but we were hiding behind the guitars. Yeah. You know? Right. You know, my. Well, were you a, a folk singer that 
learned stand up or did you also have a background in stand up i guess is or did you have to adjust because of that i had to adjust some but i you know i've always been fascinated by both comedians and singers yeah. so you know i, I get had that. certain yeah. comedic heroes mm-hmm. anyway and i've always wanted to do a whole lot of different things i've never some will call a multi-talent. I prefer to think of it as a severely short attention span. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, you know, so I, you know, my, my, my singing heroes, actually the first singer I ever imitated as a kid was Bing Crosby. Nice. Okay. <laughs> you know? So I wasn't even in that genre. Right. I mean, it was, you know, big band singers. And, uh, the second one, oddly enough, was the other end of the scale, which was Frankie Lane. Really? <laughs> yeah, okay. You know? Nice. All right. Which is it, it's strange, but there it is. You know, uh-huh. uh, going through my dad's record collection, and it, that was pretty eclectic. You know, classical. It had various different kinds of jazz, anything from from uh, traditional jazz to bebop. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the fifties. Bebop was a new thing. That yeah. you know, yeah. And uh, but on the other hand, he also had some Spike Jones records. <laughs> he had, you know, some Mort Saul. He had, you know, Nicholson May and right Stan Freeberg. Nice. <laughs> oh, know. I like some Stan Freeberg. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Funny I got guy. to hear some stuff that nobody, the general public, didn't get to hear because my dad was in the advertising business. Oh. Okay. So he, he would made, get like promotional items. Yeah. Or yeah. Something? yeah. Oh. You know, every once in a while we get the singles, the forty fives that would be sent out to DJs with the commercials on them. And right, Stan Freeberg oh, made I would love commercials. To find some of those. Okay. And you know what was funny is that there were maybe three commercials on it mm-hmm. on one side, and the other side was his programming notes. Oh, which were invariably hilarious because yeah. he was always you know poking fun at the ad business in right. these things, and they were the general public has never heard some of this stuff, and some of it is just. It was just wonderful. Yeah. It's just insane. Well, and it's fascinating, too, because the running gag on the Stan Freeberg show was the fact that they could not find a sponsor. Yeah. yeah. And here yeah. he is doing all these ad spots. Oh, yeah, really. Hilarious. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That I mean, the, you know, he has the unique distinction of being the last network radio comedian. D- I Yeah, I would say that. Okay. okay. That, I mean, very serious. And he was... He had, took a perverse pride in yeah, that. Yeah, I could see it. You know, people like, so, you know, there were there was that. Then, uh, you know, the people I saw on television, I had a, a great love of the old variety shows. Right. You there know, were a lot so, of them then, too. And there were, you know, that was it. It was the old vaudevillians mm-hmm. doing what they'd done in vaudeville, mm-hmm. you know. So my my heroes from that aspect were uh, top uh Red Skelton. Mm-hmm. Of course, yeah. You know. And uh, the Gleason and, and, you know, so on and keep going down the list. Right. And even the Smothers Brothers did do kind of the oh, same thing yeah. with the folk I music. I always loved the Smothers Brothers. Yeah. That was, that may be the ultimate expression of what, you know, folk music turned into. Yeah. You know, uh, but it was winding down in the 70s, you mm-hmm. know, uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is just, you know, the public gets tired of it. Part of it was the Hootenanny TV show. Oh. Um, and yeah. the problem with that thing was that uh, they wouldn't hire Pete Seeger because he was on the blacklist. He was on the, the, the front left over from the Red Scare of the 50s. Okay. Yeah. And so a lot of the best performers would not go on the show. Uh-huh. Okay. You know, Tom Paxton, Della. Joan Baez, so on. Yeah. None of these people would go on the show. The quality, you know, the top quality people in folk music wouldn't go. So what they wound up with is Peter, Paul, and Mary and Kingston and Trio clones yeah. singing the more insipid, <laughs> you know, tired, everybody does this, damn it, on the open mic songs. That kind of helped kill it, that. And ultimately, uh, it wound up that the, like the last folk singer in mainstream was was uh, John Denver. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's true. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, and you know, during this time period, so this is when you're still in Chicago. Yeah, I'm still in Chicago, and this is when I'm really learning the craft. Okay. And uh, there were some wonderful clubs still in Chicago. There was a place called the Barbarossa, which was over on uh, North Dearborn Street. 
north side, just off of the Rush Street Strip. Mm -hmm. And it was in the, the lobby of uh, what was called the Dearborn North Hotel. Now, this hotel had a great history. You know, it had been one of the top hotels back in the day, back in, you know, the the, 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 the war years. And, okay. And, and during the Depression. And people like Fred Astaire and that, it, it stayed in this this well, hotel. all right. The Barbarossa was the last vestige of the original lobby. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, that was the last part of the original lobby that was left, was this little bar off in the corner. They turned the lobby it. into a bar is what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's you know, cool. Yeah. And it was a wonderful place. And uh, Nancy Dow, who owned the place, used to say, you know, I don't run a, I don't run a saloon. I run a living room that serves booze. <laughs> it's actually a good slogan. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, it really was like that. I mean, it was you know, it was home to a, a lot of us. It was just a second home for a while. Mm -hmm. When I got in, when that started winding down, uh, then there was somebody else's troubles, which was owned by Earl Pianchi, the Earl of Old Town. Okay, uh, the Holstein brothers, Fred and Ed. That sounds familiar. I don't know Fred why I remember Holstein that. Fred Holstein was a quite well known folk singer in the Midwest. Okay, back back then. Uh, may, may may his memory be for a blessing. Um, he died several years ago. Okay. And uh, Steve Goodman was the other partner, partner, which is why it got the title after one of his songs, "Somebody Else's Troubles." Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but there was a that was a wonderful place, and I played the open mic there all. I never got booked there, but I played the open <laughs> mic frequently. You know, um, and I learned a lot, particularly from Fred. You know. Yeah. And 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 uh, particularly about singing, uh, Fred. Fred was one of the few people in Chicago who didn't write. Okay, <laughs> you know she, the the ethic had already come in. You have to be a songwriter, right? <laughs> you know, and I bowed to that pressure for a while. And you know, I actually spent 1976 writing something every day at a song a week. Okay, and what what sort of genre would you I say? I was still in the, in folk at that. But at were that. you were you uh, adding comedic elements, or were you doing the serious thing? Like how I you... was, I was still, you know, I was still developing my act at that point. Okay, I, I'd been at it like four years, and I was still, you know. And you're just now sitting down to become a songwriter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I seventy six. I, I I spent that whole year. I said, okay, I'm going to learn this craft. I'm going to you know nail this down. Figure yeah. out how this works. Uh, out of that period of time, out of you know fifty-two uh, more side, more than that, because sometimes I wrote more than one song a week. Out of that, I've kept three. <laughs> I'm very fussy. Okay. I've forgotten all the rest of them. Yeah, I, I don't think that's that uncommon. I think okay, yeah, yeah I could see that. Yeah, you know, and uh, but then it made the lateral most comedy clubs uh, during that period of time that the Barbarossa shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, troubles. Changed hands. Earl bought out the other partners, okay, and killed the music there because <laughs> he'd lost the Earl of Old Town had had gone under. Yeah, I mean the the market was was gone. That was it. And uh, I found kind of a second home at the most unlikely place in the world for a comedy club. Where uh, on the northwest side of Chicago, Narragansett, Belmont. Okay, up in that in the Jefferson Park neighborhood, which is if. In that part of town, in those days, I don't know how it is now, but back then, this is now, we're talking, you know, mid to late 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it wasn't a polka band or a heavy metal band, they didn't know what the hell to do with it. <laughs> Comedy club in the middle of everything. I know? like that that's the, is, you polka or you metal? Which yeah, one are yeah, you? Yeah, you know, <laughs> there was one disco in the whole neighborhood. I mean, yeah. in the whole side of town. Honestly, okay. God. Yeah, you know, and it, it, it was it was fun every once in a while on my way home from from the, it was called Colbert's Comedy Cove, yeah, the comedy club that I was in. Every once in a while, I'd stop off at this disco. I don't even remember the name of it, but it was fun to watch all these guys because it's very blue collar. You know, mm -hmm. Trying to do be John Travolta, <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, and, and it, it was fun to watch. It really was right. But at Colbert's, I was there two to four times a week. I emceed their their showcase night on Sundays and Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the new talent night, the open mic, and was frequently there on one or two days on the weekend, either as an act or as the MC. Okay, and uh, I was also playing a place in Rosemont, Illinois. Uh, it was called the Comedy Cottage. 
See, now I only see Rosemont now. Maybe it was different then, but for me right now, all it is is convention centers. Yeah, it wasn't then. <laughs> okay. It wasn't then. This is depressing. The building where this place was no longer exists. Okay. Where the building was, where the comedy cottage was, is now the entrance to the parking lot of an office building. <laughs> It's not even the damn parking lot. It's the entrance. Uh, you know, ramp. Uh, which is, it, that's just depressing. Right. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. But these were wonderful places. Uh, and, you know, we learned our craft. You know, we were doing, okay, we were doing five to ten minutes a show and getting paid gas money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So much like comedians, it's like, they, yeah. you know, they give you five or 15. Yeah. I mean, you got 25 if you were the MC. Okay. Okay. Whee! Right. <laughs> yeah. But you're in between each act. Right. So you, yeah. Yeah. Well, there were still, e e even then, there were still a few acoustic music acts that I could do. And those were, the good ones were 50 bucks a night, mm -hmm. which is still the good wage. I would, just, you know, if you get paid at all, you're probably getting paid 50 bucks. Otherwise, you're getting the door or a tip jar. Yeah. You know, which is. But and then, there were still a few of those fifty buck a nights. I was living in an apartment that was one hundred and fifty bucks a month. Oh, so if I could get three fifty buck a night <laughs> gigs in a month, I had my rent. Right, one more and I could eat. Yeah, I was going to say you, there, there's other expenses in there, but I get what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, one more. I could, I could make a living off of you know four fifty buck a, well, night gigs a month. Well, then here's and, a question. Uh, let yeah. me, let me let me ask you about this then. If if that's true. And me being a musician myself as well, why do we do this then? If you're just if, if you're just scraping by to do it, if you're just or even not even possibly getting the fifty, the three fifty dollar shows, you, you know, know, like why do we even do it? Well, I, for me, I, 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 it's I have to do this. It's who I am. Mm -hmm. It's you know I, 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 there, I went through a period where it, it when the, when I finally got set up with, with comedy because comedy was kind of drifting into sh the, what it is largely now, which is shared anger. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, and and that, I wasn't comfortable with that at all. Mm -hmm. And I I learned that craft from a bunch of old vaudevillians. Uh, so I still have kind of a bee in my bonnet about four letter words mm -hmm. about language. Yeah. Um, and it was getting to be all obscenities and, and, and shared anger, and I just wasn't comfortable, so I left comedy. Found a job with a, with a fronting up country covers band for several years. So this whole time, you were just being a musician. You weren't like, I do it on the weekends while I work a day job sort of well, thing. Well, when once the comedy thing wound down, yeah, then I had to go uh, start doing day jobs. Okay. Again. And, uh, and it was uh, what I found was industrial temping is the perfect thing for me. Okay. You know, because you go in and, you know, you're there for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe a month. Yeah. And then you're free. But the, the, I, I found that a lot of the temp agencies are pretty flexible. If I make it clear, clear walking in, Using corporate, it put it in corporate terms, saying music is my core business. Mm -hmm. I'm a musician. I want to do gigs, right. man. Right. You know, no. If I say, you know, put it to them in, in business terms. You know, yeah. music is my core business. Mm -hmm. They're pretty flexible about it. I can get off and go tour for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and come back and still be working. Yeah, you know. So that has worked for me okay. when I've needed it. Um, interesting insight. I which is, didn't think of that. That's yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, when we're done with this, I'm off to, <laughs> to a temp job. Oh, no kidding. Because I bet the I, gigs haven't been there, but the pandemic's killed, like killed. Very everything. good point. It's, you know. Wow. Yeah. It's comedy clubs all over again. Only it's a national pandemic. <laughs> yeah, really? Uh, you know, it's just, <laughs> oh, there I lost, this is true. I, it, it, I was so mad when, when this thing started, I had the best tour I had ever Booked, oh, I've talked to a few people September. that have said that. Yeah, yeah. I had seriously in two and a half weeks, I had three thousand dollars worth of work. Mm, yeah, gone. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll be able to get that back next year, and next year again, I'd be, you know, it'd be the, my fiftieth year in show business, and yeah. uh, so I've got a really good publicity hook to hang it all on, <laughs> which gives me a better selling point. Yeah, you know. Okay. Well, so, how, how do you get the word out there about that? Like when you do book shows, I guess. I guess now I'm interested. That is. 
one of the fun things about this new season of the podcast that I'm doing is I get to find out how last time it was all like, how are you adjusting to the way the world is now? It's how are you adjusting to getting back to the way the world yeah. was? So how are you getting your stuff out okay, there? Okay. Uh, at this point I have, I have a, uh, uh, I found, uh, from the national library association, they have a listing <laughs> Oh, really? All the libraries. Okay. State by state. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense, and I suppose. I go, I, I go through this and I find their websites if they have them. Mm -hmm. I mean, some are very, very small and they don't have them. Yeah. You know, don't, don't even have a website. Or, you know. And uh, at which point I kind of write them all because they're not going to have the money to hire me. I you know, need to get at least 200 to make this worth doing. You're yeah. like Jim Rockford, 200 a day plus expenses. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> I like the reference. Thank that's, you. Thank like, you. I've been watching the Rockford Files lately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I go through and it's largely I have a kind of a standard couple of emails mm -hmm. to pitch that. Uh, I also, you know, go through uh, uh, some Google searches to do uh when I'm staying local to do uh, nursing homes, to do senior centers. I saw that you actually had some booked uh, yeah. at least somewhat steadily over the past few months. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've got, I think my next one is January 9th out in Spring Green. Okay. And uh, yeah, which is fun. I liked it. You know, I'm doing basically standards, mm -hmm. which I like. They're great songs, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, uh, but how I get the word out again is largely email, sometimes phone calls because sometimes you don't get an email. And sometimes the emails you send, a lot of libraries will have a kind of general information yeah. email thing. And when you're going through that, you never get the right person <laughs> that you got to talk to. And on the, I see one of those. I will go ahead and make a phone call. Mm -hmm. And whoever answers the phone, okay, who's in charge of uh, booking special events, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, which readings. is not something you normally think of when you think of libraries, but it's like, yeah, it's true. There are special events at libraries all the time. So yeah. it, okay. you know, who's in charge of this? A lot of the times it turns out to be whoever's in, in, uh, 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 in charge of adult literature, mm -hmm. but you get, then you make your pitch, you mm -hmm. know, and then you've got an email go that goes directly. <laughs> Right. To whoever it is you need to talk to and you can send out your demo material. I have, you know, I have three uh, videos that I keep permanently on, on, on YouTube. And you use them and for I your... And I send links okay. out to those, to those three. This is kind of what the show looks like. And I have two shows that I do for mm -hmm. libraries. One is, that was Vaudeville. Mm -hmm. The other one is, uh, I was still kind of in development, but... It works, which is how to grow old disgracefully. <laughs> okay. I'm 67. You know, this is. And you're still and, doing it. So, yeah. Still, you know, I'm you, still here. You know. So you're able to sing a song about it. That makes yeah, sense. You know, no, again, that's songs, that's comedy, that's well, whatever comes into my head that relates to the subject. And you've got a duo that you do as well. Uh, yes. With an, an, uh, Sandy and Dina, who lives down in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've been doing this for now. Oh, good grief. It's got to be uh, a good 30 years. Wow. How that did we, that start? Uh, there used to be a little club down in, I met her uh, in the Barbarossa, which I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, but I got together with her and started working with her in a, in a place called His and Hers. Which again is another place where the building doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> it used to you're be just right, like bad luck for buildings. Yeah, it, it used to be right next to the Addison L station in Chicago, but they tore the building down when they expanded the L, all the L stations. Okay, uh, yeah, back in the end of the eighties, beginning of the nineties. Yeah, but it was his and hers, and this was unique because this is like the nineteen seventies. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep in mind this is the seventies that we're talking about, and this was a place that was designed to accommodate everyone, black, white, gay, straight, what, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And it was a the wonderful little place. Um, and I booked there a few times. I was the absolute regular on the open mic. The way I got started with Sandy is we we uh, we got booked. The, the owner's name was Marge Summit. And somebody came up with the idea, we should roast Marge for her birthday. 
Okay. <laughs> Always a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Roast the club owner. You know, <laughs> bite the hand that feeds yeah. you. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't we, feel like working here anymore. So let's do this. <laughs> oh, which she was wonderful about it. You know, it was. I I wanted if somebody came up with the idea of of uh, you know we should do a singing telegram, mm-hmm. and then we're all sitting around this table and everybody's you know going yeah but who can we get who's crazy enough to deliver a singing telegram at random and everybody starts looking at me right <laughs> one of the bartenders Marge owned the building. Okay. okay, so she rented out apartments upstairs. One of her bartenders was also one of her tenants. Okay. He lived upstairs. He was an actor, and he had a bunch of stuff, a bunch yeah. of costume bits out there. We pieced together a bag lady. Okay. <laughs> so, so I've gone uh, – I've done everything. I've had taken a pie in the face. I've dressed as a bag lady. I, I suppose if you're going to be labeled – a grass a... skirt with strategically placed coconuts. I, yeah. You know, you know. Von Villian. That yeah, makes yeah, sense. You know. Yeah, it was, it was a wonderful place. But uh, that's where I met her. Her, and we started working together. We had also put together a song. We had figured out uh, an arrangement for uh, a fine romance. Okay. Uh, uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Oh, did okay. It in, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I think the movie is called Melody Time. Right. A fine romance, my good woman. You know, and 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 it's a wonderful song. But we worked out an arrangement for it that worked <laughs> uh, with two guitars and and our voices. Uh, and we'd been doing, and as we'd done gigs over in our Chicago, we'd sit in and do other gigs and we'd do this, mm-hmm. you know, uh, when Sandy, uh, released her first CD, uh, she asked me to come down and to come down to Chicago. I had moved to Madison by that time. Okay. Uh, she asked me to come down to Chicago and, and do her CD release party. And around when was this? Uh, there had to be, but yeah, that's about 30 years ago, somewhere on there. I've been, no, it has to be 25 because I came, I came here in October of 94. Okay. Is when I moved to, to Madison. Okay. I hadn't worked in a while uh, in, in music. There just weren't any venues. There wasn't a band to front. Mm-hmm. And a couple of friends of mine had moved up here and were playing bars regularly, and they needed a front man. Okay. <laughs> Steve, you want to come up here? We've got work for you every week. Right, right. You know, okay, cool. You know, uh, I've been here since. Okay. So this, I think, would probably be about 97 or 8. Okay. Okay. Went down there, and we did a fine romance, and we faked our way through about two or three other songs just because we were having a good time. Yeah. And by the time it was done, we kind of looked at each other. We should make an act out of this. <laughs> we should do this. Right. You know, two, three years later, we we made a CD, mm-hmm. which is it, it, uh, which is called Because We Can, <laughs> <laughs> after one of Sandy's songs, which actually was a hit with Dr. Demento. Oh, for nice. For a while. You well, know. That's always handy. Yeah. Shortly after that, I made my first solo CD, uh, Facing Monday. Okay. Uh, Where were you recording these CDs at? Uh, we recorded the first two with a guy named Mike Wiegman, who was, okay. uh, he's out of the business now. Okay. He, he got out of the. Did he have long blonde hair? Yeah. Okay. He used to work at the Paramount Music Hall. He was a sound guy there. Yeah. And then he worked at the MMI. Yeah. Uh, Mattis Media That's, Institute. Yeah. Okay. Great guy. Mike, I love him. Yeah. We used to call him Surfer Mike. Yeah. <laughs> and Mike, uh, recorded the, 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 our first, uh, t- uh, you know, duo CD and my first solo CD. Okay. We had, we had a lot of fun with it. Um, it was a little crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was 2002 and I was I was in a very strange place. My first wife had passed away in January. Oh no. And she had a photograph uh, which is uh, the, the which became the cover of it. And I always swear I'd make a new, a new album cover. It was a blurry picture of our bathroom in Chicago, but the camera had malfunctioned and actually taken a bite out of the film. Oh. So it's a very stark picture with this blurry bath, a dark bathroom, and then these big bites out of it. Weird. And I always thought that looks like Monday morning. <laughs> I, li- I like that you went with a sarcastic twist instead of like ghosts and haunted. <laughs> no, that looks like Monday. It was the first time I saw the photograph. I said, and I said, I'm going to write a song called Facing Monday. And... That's going to be the, the the cover. Well, the song "Facing Monday" really didn't come together until after she, after she died, and it was about that, mm-hmm. you know. And it's kind of 
my coping mechanism was yeah. to write this song. Um, no, even the concept of it sounds really, it, it sounds moving. You yeah, know, it's, it, it worked and, and it works. Um, here I have, uh, I, I, when I got up here almost immediately, uh, I got New Year's Eve going into 90. My first gig up here was uh, at the old Anchor Inn. Mm -hmm. Right down the street from here. Yeah. Um, New Year's Eve, 94, going into 95. Okay. And I was opening for a blues band. So here we are in this biker bar. I'm this little folk singer <laughs> opening for a blues band. And they didn't know I was going to be there. Oh, that's always <laughs> These fun. These were the guys <laughs> who had asked me to come up in front of their country band. Okay. They also worked as a blues band. These are all blues musicians anyway. Yeah. Know? And so, you know, okay, it, it, you can turn a bunch of white blues musicians into a country band easily. Just second, first and third, guys. First right. and third. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's... A little more lap steel guitar, and then we got it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I did that. From that, I wound up hosting uh, twice a month their acoustic uh, jam night. Okay. Which is every Thursday, and I was one of three. I may have actually hosts. gone to that. So yeah. I've gone, I, I know I've gone to one at least in my lifetime over at the Anchor yeah. Inn. So. Huh. And every once in a while, I'd get hired. Uh, over over at uh, Mother Fools as MC for their open mic that they did once a month. Yeah. And uh, that from there, uh, a friend of mine named Ira McDonald, uh, who now lives, I think, up on the UP. Okay. Uh, he uh, had started an open mic at a place uh, called Speed Jump Java Joint, which used to be over on uh, East Johnson. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right across the street from Bernie's Rock Shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had gotten a job that was going to take him out of state, take him back to Michigan, mm -hmm. and was looking for somebody to take over the open mic. <laughs> yeah. And he talked me into it. You know? So, okay. I, this open mic, we were the best night they had, that the place had <laughs> for oh. a couple of years. Um, and this happened with every venue we were in. We went to three venues. Yeah. When that closed down, we wound up at a place over on Sherman called uh, Urban Market. That storefront is now uh, a real estate office. And what is we it went... with you in buildings, man? <laughs> I don't know, man. I just... <laughs> then we wound up at, at a place called Escape Java's Way. It was out here on Willie Street mm -hmm. at the sandwich shop now. Right. Yeah, and Anchor Inn isn't there anymore. Oh, no, you know. <laughs> Uh, I've outlived more venues. I think. Well, I guess that's a testament, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah they're gone. I'm still here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? But uh, I did that for six years. Okay. And uh, if I finally kind of just burned out on it, you know, there was I, I had nothing left really to contribute. I'd been doing this every week for six years. And when you were doing this, was it you were doing this instead of touring, or is touring? I was what occasionally you touring. So okay. you know, if I had to go out out of town for a while. I could usually find somebody to sub. Okay. Yeah, Ron Dennis was good. I suppose it is an open mic. You just yeah. kind of pick the first person and go, hey, want to do this for a little while? <laughs> Not to belittle what it is. No. <laughs> uh, Ron was, was always, you know, part of this. Ron was part of what he had taken over Ira's open mic for a little while. Okay. And uh, and he has run other open mics. Yeah. On that. So Ron was good for it. If Ron couldn't do it, I'd go to, to, to Nancy. You know, it was, uh, I have to say, uh, Madison's most prolific songwriter. Hmm. But she really started performing on my open mic when it was an urban market because she lived across the street. Okay. <laughs> she came in over mm -hmm. every Friday. She so was it was there. easy enough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when she started out, it was beautiful. She would start out on this little bitty Casio uh -huh. keyboard, kind of leaning off of the mic about five. <laughs> so oh. Took a while to talk her into, you know, into the mic. Dear, yeah. Into the mic. But the, eventually she started bringing her full keyboard, slapping that across the street, and oh. started writing. And she's off and running. She's a, a, one of the movers and shakers now in form, February Album Writing Month, mm -hmm. and uh, which is a, an online challenge to write uh, 28 songs in 
February one, <laughs> 14 songs in the 28 days of February. Yeah. No, there's you know, another one too called the RP, uh, RPM, which is, I don't yeah. remember what it stands for anymore, but yeah, I don't know why everybody picks February to do that. Maybe just because there's nothing. No, January is the month that nothing's going on. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Now, Sorry. Just had a little February is a shorter month. It's, you know, 14 is a, is an easier mark. To, yeah, to that's hit. true. On the other hand, they have a, they have another, they developed another channel. It's called, uh, I think it's called 4090, mm-hmm. which is, it's June, July, and August, <laughs> right? 40 songs in those three months. Yeah. You know, and she's done that and then exceeded it beyond that too. Been wow. Able to do that. I mean, she's, she's just amazing. Yeah. Um, that it's only two years out that she finally recorded the Plankett CD. <laughs> <laughs> We've been after it for years, you know. So we, she just we, got all these songs. Put some of these up, it, you know, somewhere. Well, after, this stuff. And after a while, it gets harder because then it's like I can only pick this many. Yeah. You know, you you got that many songs and stuff like that, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, but what about you? What have you been writing these days? How are you? I've been writing, writing comedy. Yeah, I've been. I, I've been uh, I'm preparing to start doing a, a a regular online show, which will go on Vimeo. And on uh, YouTube. And, and was this inspired by the fact that we were all learning how to do online video this past well, no, year? <laughs> I was doing it about five, six years ago on a on a uh, on, a, on an internet broadcasting station uh, called Red Dragon TV. Which yeah, which is there John. anymore? Yeah, Ari. Well, Ari John fell on hard times, and you know he lost the building. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. oh my god! You Again know. with the buildings. Yeah, <laughs> he, 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 you know. And now he is he has turned to the to the ministry, and that's oh. what he's using his tech for. And huh? Cool. Interesting. You know? Yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of on my own, but I for for a couple of years I did a VJ show uh, called Escape to Music. Okay. And a comedy show which originally was called the Andina Rich Comedy Hour. Yeah. And eventually turned into a thing called Wackazoids. Wackazoids. Now, is this more in the? Would you say it's like the Dr. Demento sort of comedy? No, or what no. You, this, okay. is, this, this is a visual comedy. This is part Rowan and Martin's laugh-in. Come on, really? Part Muppet Show, part Adult Swim, and part uh, uh, MTV in its heyday. Wow. You Man. know, I mean, elements You have no from idea the imagery of, that's going in through my head right <laughs> you know, now. Okay. So it's a lot of short sketches, Okay. you know, short gags, uh, songs, some longer sketches. I've got some longer sketches like uh, an advice thing called i call that i call ask uncle fungus <laughs> okay <laughs> hosted by hi i'm your host william tecumseh peabody <laughs> and, i like uh, that you're doing this that's fun yeah okay. and it is it's a lot of fun to do and i don't have to travel <laughs> you exactly know? Yeah, you know no, and i can monetize i can monetize that you're right yeah you know, i can monetize this and uh I'm going to, you know, like I said, I'm going to do a big tour next year, but mm-hmm. I don't think I'm going to do a lot of touring after that. Mm-hmm. I just, I can't resist the PR hook of my 50th anniversary show business. Right. I mean, I can't walk away from that. Well, and as far as promoting the um, the online video show that you're creating, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you do your you do your groundwork. You you contact the people. I mean, the whole thing with like going through the list of libraries and then yeah. finding the people and emails and knowing where to send them. I, oh, yeah. I like the fact that you put in the groundwork for this oh, type yeah. of stuff. So it'd be interesting to see what you do with an online event. Yeah, it, it's you know, and again, it's a you know, it's all pre recorded, and I I I spent years now learning right. how to how to edit this thing. And yeah, the, the the couple of years with. Uh, with, with, with uh, Red Dragon TV, yeah, was was an education all the way around. Learned from experience, I, totally. You know, I learned animation. I learned, you know, editing. Yeah, you know, I actually learned a certain level of filmmaking because there's a lot of live action and and puppet stuff that you know you just I love we that did there's in puppets studio. in it. You do know. you make the puppets? What are you? No, I I I, I do a little sketch called Store Bought Puppet Theater, and these are okay. puppets I found like in thrift shops, toy stores, okay. whatever. So know. they're they're just a ragtag group of Muppets or yeah. puppets, is yeah, what yeah puppets, yeah. yeah. Uh, little hand puppets. I have a little sketch that I do, the one that I, that I completed, and I'm going to rework because I found all the originals, <laughs> and mm-hmm. I can re-edit this thing and make it shorter and snappier. Yeah, uh, is uh, which is very important. Yeah. yeah. 
chicken, little, little, little chicken. <laughs> and there's a running gag. Everybody addresses him as a little chicken. Why does everybody get my name backwards? I, I never expected you to be doing voices. <laughs> you know, I love it. Everybody, you know, everybody in it is a puppet except for the wizard that they find. They finally go to a wizard. Okay. And the wizard is me in a wizard costume. <laughs> Of course. Doing He's, doing a Phil Silver's impression. I love it. Yes, well, little chicken. What seems to be the problem today? Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, ultimately he solves the problem the sky is falling by making it rain. Yeah. What do you mean, make it rain? How does that help? <laughs> little chicken, if the rain's going to come down, the sky has to stay up. I was not expecting this. I don't know how to react. <laughs> Go ahead, laugh. That's uh, no, why no, I, I do am, this. I am, okay. I am. Yeah. So when do, when are the plans for this uh, to come out? Like when are you thinking of doing this? This is I'm I'm hoping to get you know at least five episodes in the can before the end of July. Oh, nice! And, and wow, so it's actively in the yeah, process. Okay, yeah, it's in process now. I've got a lot of footage that we we. Uh, Shot at uh, Red Dragon TV Studio. You get to that repurpose that. Yeah, yeah, I can repurpose oh, a lot of it. That's brilliant. There's stuff I've never used. I've got stuff. John Duggleby. I don't know if you know John Duggleby. I don't think so. John Duggleby, very fine, fine uh, singer songwriter locally. He also does children's programs. And when he does oh. that, he does that dressed as a chicken. Okay. As one does. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so I've got stuff of him in the chicken suit. Awesome. Also him in the chicken suit interacting with my chicken puppets. <laughs> you know, so okay. I've got all kinds of stuff going here. I've got animations. Uh, I'm working on working on a sketch. I have uh, an uh, interview of TV interview shows. Okay. You know, the, the cable news or the Sunday morning gab fest. Gotcha. All right. And I haven't decided on the title yet. It's either going to be. Meet the depressed or disgrace the nation. Nice. <laughs> like I just haven't made that decision. But that can be an ongoing sketch of interviews because mm -hmm. politicians are always doing strange and disconcerting things. Yes. <laughs> I, we've we've covered so much subjects right now. It's, <laughs> I know we're uh, all over the place. But if people did want to learn more about you or see the stuff that you're doing, or if they wanted to, um, when you do come out with the yeah. video, like where where should people go to find out more about Stephen you? Lee Rich. Dot com. Okay. I am also at Old Yodeler on Twitter. Nice. Love it. I am, I'm on Facebook mm -hmm. as well. But, you know, the main thing is is the, the website, StephenLeeRich.com. Also, AndinaAndRich.com. For the duo. For the duo. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. I want to thank you so much for coming out and talking to me. Thank you for having me. I've had a great time. Mm -hmm.